Post-conviction DNA testing is the use of DNA evidence to look at samples that were not tested at the time of the original trial and be used to potentially show the innocence of someone who has been in prison because they were convicted of a crime that they may not have committed. Some states have laws that allow for post-conviction DNA testing and they have a defined path for that um, and other states don't. I was reading the news yesterday and I read that the Supreme Court of the United States ruled six to three that Rodney Reed from Texas could get post-conviction DNA testing on some of the evidence that he was requesting that for but he had to follow those channels all the way up to the Supreme Court in order to get access. What DNA, in my opinion, has done, the DNA, forensic DNA testing in the criminal justice arena has done, is it has exposed the fact that innocent people are convicted and, and even that guilty people are go free because of that. When you're confronted with the fact that people can be erroneously convicted, are erroneous con erroneously convicted, and have been erroneously convicted, it kind of forces you to say, well, gosh, you know, if we, if we execute somebody, we don't get to go back and undo that. And that's a really scary thing. If we open the Pandora's box and something untoward hops out, we want to know that. And I think as scientists, we're always going to lean toward testing. But, you know, it's going to take some time. And I think as DNA analysts, as, as the viewership, um, that we want to work together with the judicial and with the prosecutors and the defense attorneys for them to understand that this is a human science, that human analysts can make mistakes. But I think the law enforcement community sort of needs to look at a case where a, a credible innocence clinic is, has looked at a case and sees that there really could potentially be a problem with the original trial. I think it's in law enforcement's best interest to listen carefully on what the argument is and keep an open mind and just sort of think to yourself, you know, is it possible that, that we, we investigated a crime and an innocent person went to prison. And I think that leads to the, you know, the, the, we've seen a lot of post-conviction units, you know, conviction integrity units. And I think that, you know, my hope is that more resources are devoted to that. And the resistance to those efforts begins to dissipate. And I think, you know, in continuing that, if we can help people understand that, you know, despite your best efforts, you could be part of this. So my professional experience and training is in forensic DNA, and I worked for a few months in the laboratory before I decided that maybe that wasn't the best fit for me. Um, and shortly after I started, I enrolled in law school. My feeling is that there's a social significance to what we do. And it certainly drove me to forensic science because I had you know, this epiphany when I was younger that I wanted to do something that was personally meaningful. And could you think of something more meaningful than contributing to you know, the, the, the adjudication of a case like this, right? To the administration of justice. And so it appeals to people. When I transitioned from DNA Labs International into teaching, I decided to do some consulting and review cases from some of the labs down here. Um, and I saw things that I didn't expect to see. So it really showed me the variation from lab to lab and that maybe not everybody's understanding of the principles of interpretation were the same. And that maybe there were some things going on that, you know, weren't 100% correct, and I could see how wrongful convictions could happen from some of these honest but problematic mistakes. So, you know, I think it takes uh, people of incredible, like I'll say bravery, but you know, fortitude to do this work and to question the work product of people that they might have been themselves a few years prior. And so, you know, how do I navigate those waters? You know, how do I challenge you know, the investigative work product. Again, it's by, by sort of limiting myself to the, the evidence and, you know, without denigrating the work, because I know those people are, are almost always trying to do good work and are trying to operate ethically. 
but they've arrived at the wrong opinion, the wrong decision. And my goal is to see or to, you know, to shine a light on another interpretation or perhaps an error in logic that is useful for the court to know in assessing this motion for post-conviction relief. I found that looking through those old files, seeing what evidence there is to potentially retest, examining transcripts for misstatements at the original trial that might allow someone to get a new trial. I found that to be really interesting. It's like issue spotting, you're looking, it's Easter egg hunting, mm -hmm. sort of. And that's how I kind of got hooked on that kind of work. It feels like really good work, powerful work, especially here where we have the death penalty. Around 2005, uh, an old law school colleague of mine uh, who you know we had kept up with each other and actually had done some cases together, et cetera. Uh, Jeff Blackburn um, approached me about getting into um, post-conviction actual innocence cases. I hadn't really done that many post-conviction cases. Jeff and I formed this nonprofit, the Innocence Project of Texas, as a 501c3 nonprofit in 2006 and started looking at cases. Tim Cole's case was one of the very first cases we looked at. I remember we got a letter in my office, and not that we're any different than any other innocence organization in this respect, but we get hundreds of letters a month. And so um, we, can't do, we, we can't litigate hundreds of cases a month, you know. Um, and, and so we have to give each one the attention it deserves. And then, and then find the right ones to continue to pursue. So what is the lesson I want people to take away from this? That, that while we're in an adversarial process, right, and that, that the nature of that won't change, I feel that there is more resistance to really examining cases once they've been adjudicated. There is, you know, this concept of finality that a jury's verdict is sacrosanct and it should only be revisited under very, very specific circumstances. And, and when we realize that the way that we use forensic science and the development of techniques that we couldn't even comprehend a generation ago have changed the way we understand evidence in cases, we should not be sort of immediately opposed to looking at things that we thought were resolved and that there's value. And I think that if we are, if we all approach this um, open-mindedly, we would have more confidence in the criminal justice system because we would know that when somebody raises an issue uh, uh, that could be addressed through a post-conviction motion, that we didn't dismiss it through procedure or through resistance we, we dealt with it by assessing the question and looking at the evidence. And because there are situations where, you know, the conviction was the appropriate outcome. Um, and we need, but we need to know that. And for every case that's like that, there are a lot of cases where we are making those arguments and, or others are making those arguments and we are contributing to those arguments and, and there's no cooperation. How you solve that problem is, is multifaceted and will clearly take a long time, but you know, because I might primarily work on the side of the defense or, or really on the side of the plaintiff in a post-conviction motion, doesn't mean that I am uh, opposed to forensic science or opposed to the work, the good work that forensic scientists do all, uh, every day. It's just that the, the information might not have been used in the correct way, or it might have been misunderstood by a well-intentioned jury that simply didn't fully appreciate what the limitations of that evidence were. Uh, and so I would like us to see, I would like us to develop a way of better approaching this that wasn't so onerous, time-consuming, uh, and ultimately defeating on, on the people who seek it. You know, that there are, there are wrongful convictions and they deserve to be considered. It was mistaken eyewitness identification um, involving two young girls. And 
Um, I was in the CIU at the time, and, and of course he was being represented by the Innocence Project of Texas, which I had to, you know, leave when I went into the DA's office. And what I'd found, in, there was a case that New York had brought to us, Cornelius Dupree, um, who at that time was the longest serving Texas inmate to be exonerated. And, and what New York, what, actually it was Nina Morrison with New York, who's a, you know, recently been named a federal district judge in the Eastern District of New York. She was the attorney on Cornelius Dupree's case and in his case, I mean, trigger warning, I guess I'm getting a little graphic here, um, the only evidence left over in his case were the pubic hair cuttings of the victim. And um, those are not particularly helpful, uh, I didn't think. I mean, maybe pubic hair combings that might contain the perpetrator's pubic hairs. Um, but she said, no, there is a, um, lab in California that can extract, if, if they're there, can extract male DNA off the cuttings that somehow has become entwined with, the, with the, the victim's pubic hair cuttings that are gathered at the time of a sexual assault kit. And sure enough, he was able to, do, this lab guy was able to do it. And so we were able to exonerate Cornelius Dupree. You know, he's a great guy. Uh, and so, anyway, it was the same with Johnny Pinchback. And, and so, you know, his lawyers with Innocence Project of Texas, you know, said, well, unfortunately, there's only the pubic hair cuttings. I said, well, I just learned of this new technique that probably, you know, if, if we give them the information on how this California lab did it, our local lab, Orchid Cellmark, was who we used a lot then. Uh, probably they can replicate that and see if they can extract male DNA off the pubic hair cuttings in Johnny's case. And they said, okay. And so I contacted the lab and they said, I, we don't see, I don't think they'd ever done it before, that, but they said, well, we don't see any reason why we can't do it. And uh, so they did, and it was not his DNA, and he was exonerated. It was that hail right here on earth, pure hail right here on earth, man. Johnny Pinchback spent 27 years behind bars for a crime he didn't commit. Pinchback was convicted of aggravated sexual assault and sentenced to 99 years in prison. Man, it is very hurtful, very painful. Thanks to DNA evidence in the Texas Innocence Project, Pinchback has been a free man for 11 years. Now he's on our board of directors and uh, um, spends time helping other exonerees and, and wrongfully convicted people. Thank you.